Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Thyroid Federation International welcomes you across the globe uh, for joining in this webinar. We have people from Australia, Philippines, Nepal, India, Africa, Europe, Canada, US, Brazil on this webinar today. Uh, so welcome uh, to the 13th International Thyroid Awareness Week. Um, this is the second year in a row that uh, we have to have this uh, uh, celebrations online. Uh, my name is uh, Ashok Basim. I'm your uh, Thyroid Federation International President and facilitator for the webinar. The presentation will be on shortly. Uh, that has been kindly developed by uh, Michael uh, Zimmerman, who is a professor in nutrition and medicine uh, from Zurich, Switzerland. Um, now, I would uh, like to introduce uh, our eminent professor, Michael uh, Zimmerman. He has been a professor of human nutrition at the Department of Health Sciences and Technology since 2012. He's from Michigan, U.S., and holds both Swiss and U.S. citizenship. Professor Zimmerman concluded his studies in uh, biological sciences at the State University of New York, uh, USA, with uh, BA in 1981. In 1988, he received his MD from Vanderbilt University, in Nashville, Tennessee. And in 1994, he earned an MSc in Nutritional Sciences from the University of California, Berkeley, California. Uh, so thanks uh, to Professor Theophilo San Luis from Philippines for arranging this lecture with Dr. Zimmerman for all of us today. I want to give the credit where it is due. Without the support of Merck, KGA, Germany, Horizon Pharma, Exilexus USA, and Porto Novelli, the host of this WebEx, this webinar would not have been possible. So thanks to all of our sponsors for making this happen. And uh, now I would uh, like to hand over to Dr. Zimmerman, which is around 35 minutes presentation. And if there are some questions, we will take those questions. And uh, after that, I will conclude the meeting. So here, hand over to Dr. Zimmerman. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Zimmerman. I'm a professor of nutrition and medicine from Zurich, Switzerland. And it's a great pleasure to be speaking at the ITAW. I'm going to be talking today about the effects of iodine deficiency on maternal and child health. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Now, Jim Grant, who was the UNICEF executive director for many years, um, was a champion for children, especially when it came to nutrition. And he said famously that enough iodine is every child's right. The content of my presentation will include iodine deficiency, why is it so important? Then what is the current global situation? Up, uh, do we need uh, iodine salt for pregnant and lactating women or do we need supplements as well? Should the food industry use iodized salt? And finally, um, salt or sodium reduction. Is this a challenge to iodized salt programs? Now, as you all know, goiter is the most visible effect of iodine deficiency, but the most important effect is mental retardation. Goiter, of course, is a way of detecting iodine deficiency in populations. In this beautiful picture from um, this woman from uh, the DRC in Africa, you can see that goiter is present. Um, and this, of course, is, a, is, a, is an indication that there's iodine deficiency population. But what we're really worried about is not so much goiter, which is really a cosmetic problem, but more the effect of iodine deficiency, the underlying iodine deficiency on brain development and mental retardation. Now, it's, it's well known that iodine deficiency during pregnancy damages the fetal brain. Uh, in, you can see here some histomicrographs of iodine sufficient versus iodine deficient uh, brain tissue from famous experiments done by Basil Hetzel yeah, in animals back in the early 1960s. But you can see that there's decreased proliferation and myelinization and overall decreased and reduced brain architecture uh, caused by iodine deficiency. And what this means is if it's severe during, um, during pregnancy, it, it, it yields um, the, 
the condition called cretinism, which is severe iodine deficiency in utero causing um, severe mental impairment and um, impairments in growth. On the left, you see here an, a classic neurological cretinism, a cretin, and here on the right, you see uh, myxodematous cretin. So this, of course, is the tip of the iceberg, very severe iodine deficiency during pregnancy causing severe, um, severe mental retardation. Now, maybe as important is that uh, not only does severe maternal iodine deficiency lower IQ in, um, obviously in cretins, but it also does in, in children who are born non cretinous and look fairly normal when born, but they have a lower uh, developmental quotient as shown by these two classic studies, one from Central Africa and one from two-year-old uh, two children in China showing that when compared to offspring from mothers who are given iodine during pregnancy, those who are not supplemented, uh, you can see that the development quotient is about, let's say, 10 to 15 points down. So not only does um, severe iodine deficiency in utero cause cretinism, it also reduces the developmental quotient in areas um, of severe deficiency. Now, um, Peter Taylor did this uh, meta-analysis where he looked at the impact of iodine supplementation in mild to moderate iodine deficiency on school children. And uh, there are only two studies. One was done in New Zealand and one was done in Eastern Europe. But both of them showed that iodine deficiency and iodine supplementation had a significant effect on overall cognitive function in school children. And these were children with only mild to moderate iodine deficiency. So not only does iodine uh, treatment during pregnancy to correct iodine deficiency improve IQ and development, but also iodine supplementation of only mild to moderate um, iodine deficiency in school-aged children also has benefits on cognition. Now, WHO has very nicely summarized the effect, efficacy and safety of salt iodization to prevent iodine deficiency disorders in this systematic review led by Dan, uh, Dr. Nancy Alberto, and looking at 89 studies around the world, they found a 82% decrease in goiter, an 87% decrease in cretinism, and a 73% decrease in low IQ, that is IQ less than 70 points. So really massive benefits in terms of um, uh, reducing goiter and reducing cretinism and improving IQ when salt iodization is introduced into populations. Now, iodine deficiency is not only important in mothers and their children, but also in older adults. Uh, this famous figure from uh, Denmark shows you the incidence rates of hyperthyroidism in uh, men and women in two areas of Denmark, one that was mildly iodine deficient, Copenhagen, and one that was moderately iodine deficient in Aalborg, in northern Denmark. And you can see that uh, with age, there's an increasing in uh, risk of hyperthyroidism. And you can see that that risk is much higher in the uh, women in uh, the area of moderate iodine deficiency compared to women in areas of mild iodine deficiency. So this study suggests that especially in, in older women in areas of even mild iodine deficiency, there's an increased rate of hyperthyroidism. This occurs because um, in mild to moderate ID, there's an increase in thyroid activity that can compensate for low iodine intakes and maintain new thyroidism uh, in most people. But this comes at a price because it involves chronic thyroid stimulation, which increases toxic nodules and hyperthyroidism. Um, so, um, you know, iodine deficiency is important throughout the life cycle. Uh, and in this discussion today, I'm talking mainly about mothers and children. But just remember, it's also an important determinant of thyroid disorders in the adult population. Now we've made remarkable progress against iodine deficiency around the world through the introduction of iodized salt. And I'd like to just show you a series of maps which shows the, 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 this progress. I mean, it's been described by WHO as one of the uh, most impressive public health triumphs of, of the century. Uh, in 1993, based on goiter rates in mainly children, 
you can see that there were 113 countries with elevated goiter rates suggesting that, that they were iodine deficient. You can see that many countries had severe deficiency. Um, usually that meant that more than 40% of children were, had goiter. By 2003, with the introduction of iodized salt throughout Latin America, much of Sub-Saharan Africa and India and China, uh, only 54 countries remained iodine deficient. By this time, we were monitoring iodine status through urinary iodine concentrations <clears throat> rather than goiter rates. By 2007, you can see a further decrease, only 47 countries deficient. By 2012, further progress, only 30 countries now are iodine deficient. But you can also see that iodine excess is appearing in some countries. And um, uh, this is, of course, something we have to be very careful of when we introduce iodine salt into populations that we get it right. We don't give too much. And um, in some countries, because of high intakes of salt and high concentrations of iodine and salt, we were providing too much iodine to populations. Um, and you can see that there were some countries with excess. Uh, by 2021, the current situation now, you can see that uh, only 19 countries remain iodine deficient around the world. Um, we have data on most countries, which is remarkable because uh, the quality of the data is quite high from these surveys. Many of them are national um, or large subnational data sets. So we still have problems in several countries in Africa, Russia, Ukraine, some European countries remain iodine deficient, but most countries around the world remain only mild iodine deficient in 2021. You can see here in this graphic that the number of iodine deficient countries has fallen from 1990 when about 113 countries at the national level were deficient down to only 19 in 2021. So really remarkable, um, remarkable progress against iodine deficiency around the world. Now, we usually define uh, progress against iodine deficiency by looking at urinary iodine concentrations in children. But what about pregnant and lactating women? Of course, this is a different population, a population at increased risk of iodine deficiency. These are two beautiful paintings from the Renaissance in a period in Italy, showing that even back then in, in, in many regions of Europe, many pregnant and lactating women would develop goiter because they had for, uh, borderline or low iodine intakes. Now, this is a, the, the 2017 map of iodine status in pregnant women around the world. And you can see this looks very different from the, the map showing progress against iodine deficiency in school aged children. Many pregnant women around the world remain mildly iodine deficient, including populations in countries like the United States, uh, in France, the UK, Switzerland, where I live, India, the Philippines, Australia. So there remains um, mild iodine deficiency in many, many parts of the world when we look specifically at pregnant women. And for example, in Europe, you can see that most European countries, if you look at pregnant women and measure UICs, uh, the median UIC will be less than 150 micrograms per liter, suggesting mild to moderate iodine deficiency. Now, the reason that so many pregnant women have low iodine intakes is because their iodine requirement is so much higher than in non-pregnancy. So here you see recommendations for daily iodine intake from the US Institute of Medicine and from the World Health Organization. But you can see that compared to non-pregnant women, the there's an increase in iodine requirement um, from 150 to 220, so up to 290 micrograms per day in lactating women. So very sharp increase in iodine requirements to maintain maternal and fetal euthyroidism means that many pregnant women are unable to meet this requirement and are mildly iodine deficient. Now, um, is it that important to provide iodine supplements to these uh, mild to moderately uh, deficient pregnant women? Uh, that's still a matter of debate. Uh, it's not certain whether maternal iodine supplements are beneficial. Several uh, expert thyroid organizations like the American and European Thyroid Associations do recommend uh, iodine supplements be given to pregnant women in areas of mild deficiency. 
Um, they, they, they state that there's not much data available, but until more data becomes available, it's prudent to supplement at about 150 micrograms per day. In contrast, the World Health Organization does not recommend supplements in areas of mild iodine deficiency in pregnancy. Um, they uh, estimate that pregnant women should be able to cover their needs for iodine from stores in the thyroid and from increased plasma clearance of circulating iodine, even if the uh, median urinary, urinary iodine concentration is slightly low at about 100 to 150. So there's a current debate about whether supplements are needed in mildly deficient pregnant women. Now, there's some data from, um, I mean, we, we, we believe that the effects of mild iodine deficiency in pregnancy would be mediated through effects on maternal thyroid function, right? We believe that the, the effects on brain development uh, in an iodine deficient pregnancy are due to insufficient thyroid hormone in the brain of the developing fetus. Um, several studies, not looking at iodine status, but looking at whether mild, uh, whether treatment of mild maternal hypothyroidism uh, has benefits in terms of IQ. This one's the famous CAT study published in 2012. This was done in Italy and in the UK. And what they did was they treated maternal subclinical hypothyroidism or uh, maternal hypothyroxemia, uh, normal TSH and a low free T4 with 150 micrograms per day of thyroxine. Uh, there were 404 controls and 390 treated women uh, they found when they measured child IQ at three years via the Wechsler scales that there was no difference between the two groups. So treatment of mild, um, mild hypothyroidism in pregnancy in this study had no benefit. Similarly, in this study, which was done in the US by Brian Casey and the Human Development Maternal Fetal Medicine Units Network, they uh, began treatment for subclinical hypothyroidism or hypothyroxemia during pregnancy, beginning at between eight and 20 weeks of gestation. And in this study, similarly to the CAT study, this did not result in significantly better cognitive outcomes in children measured a little later at five years of age um, compared to those that did not receive treatment for hypothyroidism during pregnancy. So it looks like from these two big studies that uh, treatment of very mild hypothyroidism or hypothyroxemia in pregnancy is not beneficial. And that's informative because that's what we're, we think we're doing with iodine supplements, right? Is preventing mild hypothyroidism during pregnancy. Now, there's been a lot of um, studies looking at uh, observational studies, looking at the effects of inadequate iodine status in pregnant women on cognitive outcomes. And this is one of the best studies. This was the Alspach or Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children study, uh, where they looked at pregnant women in the UK, uh, women were in their first trimester, uh, there were a thousand of them in this analysis, and those with a spot urinary iodine concentration that was greater than 150 micrograms per gram creatinine, um, in, in when their children were measured at eight to nine years, there were 2.2 point higher mean IQ scores uh, in those children, um, when, when the UIC compared to uh, children from mothers who had a UIC less than 150 micrograms per gram creatinine, so slightly higher IQ scores in the in the uh, women who had higher uh, iodine intakes in the first trimester, and if you compared um, the women who had a spot UIC greater than 150 to those who had a spot UIC less than 50 then there was a six point difference in IQ comparing um, children at eight to nine years. And this was adjusted for many potential compounding variables. Unfortunately, thyroid functions were not available for the study. Now, um, other non-randomized and observational studies have looked at the effects of maternal iodine status on infant outcomes. And really the results are fairly discrepant. Some studies show benefits, some studies show no benefit, a couple of studies even show potential harm in terms of supplementation. It's difficult to interpret. The only, um, iodine, the only study which is looked in terms of a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled design on whether iodine supplementation in pregnancy in mild iodine efficiency can affect child development 
is this study, which I did together with colleagues from Thailand, India, and the Netherlands. And in this study, uh, studying women in Southern India and in Thailand, we compared daily oral administration of 200 micrograms of iodine versus placebo in mildly iodine deficient pregnant women. And uh, there were 832 women who entered the study. We looked at maternal thyroid functions, at birth outcomes, at newborn and infant development, and the primary outcome was development uh, at five to six years of age. We also measured hearing. This is really the first RCT and the only one to date to assess the effect of maternal iodine supplementation on, on uh, child development in mild iodine efficiency. Here you can see some of the data from that study. You can see the baseline maternal urinary iodine concentrations on the left. You can see that the women in Thailand were more iodine deficient than the women in India. Um, in the pool data on the right, you can see the increase in the median urinary iodine concentration from first through third trimester with a nice difference between the iodine treated versus placebo women. However, you can see in the placebo women that their median urinary iodine concentration is right around 150 micrograms per liter um, as shown by the lower border of the shaded gray box, suggesting that they were just achieving iodine sufficiency as well. So that may have um, made um, detect, detect differences a bit more difficult. Anyway, there was a substantial increase in uh, iodine intake associated with supplementation. And when we measured uh, infant development first at one year and two years using the Bailey scales, we found um, no differences between the groups in terms of overall infant development at one or two years of age. This was measured in 430 babies. And finally, when we measured developmental outcomes at 5.4 years of age and 313 of the babies, we found no differences on the Wexler uh, preschool and primary scale of intelligence. Um, we also looked at uh, the global executive composite score from the behavioral rating inventory of executive function and also found no difference. So it looked like in this study that treatment of mild iodine deficiency with iodine was not beneficial in terms of affecting um, child outcomes. Uh, we concluded that supplementation of 200 micrograms per day in mild iodine deficient pregnant women is safe, which is important. There, were no, there was no adverse effect on thyroid disorders or TPO antibodies. Um, this level of supplementation was effective in increasing maternal iodine intakes into the sufficient range. It had a very modest beneficial effect on maternal thyroid function. We saw slightly lower TSH and lower thyroglobulin in the treated women but again, there was no effect on infant or child neural development. Um, so this suggests it's probably um, um, a good message in that in pregnant women with mildly deficient iodine intakes, it looks like the maternal thyroid is able to adapt by increasing clearance of plasma iodide and also drawing from thyroidal iodine stores that have been built up before pregnancy. And this, is it. this enables a woman to meet the increased requirements of pregnancy and ensure youth thyroidism and normal development in children. Now, um, uh, it would be great to have more data on this, this issue. It would be very nice to have more randomized controlled trials looking at iodine supplementation in mild to moderately deficient pregnant women. But this is um, what we have in terms of available data. So WHO recommends um, in terms of universal salt iodization and iodine supplements for women, I think that um, these recommendations are supported by that randomized controlled trial that universal salt ionization remains the key strategy to eliminate iodine deficiency disorders and where USI has been effective for at least two years with household salt adequately iodized and consumed by the majority of the population. And if the median UIC is uh, at least 100 micrograms per liter in children, suggesting that overall population iodine status is sufficient then the iodine needs of pregnant and lactating women should be covered by the iodine salt program. And dietary iodine together with increased thyroidal iodine clearance and thyroid iodine stores should be sufficient for thyroid hormone synthesis. But again, we need more data on this issue. What about uh, supplementing lactating women and their infants? 
we saw in the requirements table that the requirement for iodine is actually it's at its highest during lactation because the uh, breastfeeding mother must be able to transfer over enough iodine in breast milk to the baby to cover the baby's need for iodine and also needs to meet her iodine requirements for thyroid hormone synthesis. In this study, which we did in Morocco, we compare, compare direct iodine supplementation of infants versus supplementation of the breastfeeding mothers. This was a double blind randomized placebo controlled trial in 482 mother infant pairs. The infants were enrolled into the study when they were at a mean age of only two weeks old, so very early. Um, the procedures were that in the indirect infant supplementation group, we gave the mother oral iodized oil, which is a depot form of iodine where you provide a large amount of iodine, which is then uh, deposited into adipose tissue and gradually uh, released and this can provide enough iodine for individuals for up to one year after a single dose. So we gave the mother 400 milligrams of oral iodine as iodized oil and the infant got a placebo. So that's the indirect supplementation group where the iodine for the infant is coming through breast milk. And then there was the direct infant supplementation group where the mother received placebo and the infant received directly uh, while breastfeeding a hundred milligrams of oral iodine as a half a capsule of iodized oil. So in this study here, you can see first the urinary iodine concentrations in the mothers. Uh, the mothers in the study were moderately iodine deficient with a median of around 30 to 40 microgram per liter. And you can see that um, not surprisingly, there's no change in the median urinary iodine concentration in the mothers who, where the iodine was being given directly to their babies. But in the mothers who received the iodine supplementation, you can see this led to a significant increase in urinary iodine concentration in the women themselves. Then we looked at breast milk iodine concentrations, which of course is the pathway by which um, iodine supplements given to breastfeeding women would reach their infants. And you can see that breast milk iodine concentration was significantly higher in the women who received the iodine supplements compared to um, the mother-child pairs where the infant was directly supplemented. So um, the iodine supplementation in, pregnant, uh, sorry, in lactating women was effective in improving not only urinary iodine concentrations in the mothers, but also breast milk iodine concentrations. You can see this effect lasts for about nine months after a single dose of iodized oil. Now, if you look at the urinary iodine concentrations in the infants, you can see that actually the, the, the study, the, the population that received the iodine through breast milk, the indirect route, actually did better than the group that received it directly. So the babies who were getting iodine through the breast milk from their mother actually had higher urinary iodine concentrations than the group that was receiving the iodized oil directly, which was a bit of a surprise. Um, and when we looked at hypothyroidism in the infants, which of course is the main outcome we were worried about, um, you can see that, first of all, at, at baseline, at, um, at less than two months of age, about 40 to 43% of babies either had hypothyroxinemia or um, mild hypothyroidism. So in this area of moderate iodine deficiency, you can see that infants appear to be very sensitive to low iodine intakes with a, with a substantial number of them being hypothyroid. You can see after um, indirect and direct supplementation with iodine, there's a dramatic decrease in the prevalence of hypothyroidism, but you can see actually that in the babies who received the iodine through breast milk, the red indirect infant supplementation, they actually did better in terms of this completely eliminated uh, hypothyroxinemia or hypothyroidism from the babies. So this, this study suggested that when you, when you, if you want to provide iodine supplements to breastfeeding babies, it's best to give it to the lactating mother and have her deliver the iodine through breast milk to the baby. So um, if you need to give iodized oil in areas of moderate to severe deficiency to lactating women, um, you should give it directly to them and not to the babies and adequate iodine will be passed through the breast milk to the infant to maintain 
uh, infant euthyroidism. Okay, um, one important theme in iodine nutrition nowadays is that in industrialized countries and actually in many um, middle income countries, more and more of our salt intakes are coming from processed foods. So when we try to deliver iodine to populations through iodized salt, it's important to not only iodize table salt, but also processed foods need to contain iodized salt. If you look at this simple graph here, this is um, iodine intakes in the UK, I'm sorry, salt intakes in the UK, and you can see that processed and restaurant foods supply 77% of salt intake. Um, and, and, and eating at the home, uh, in terms of discretionary uh, iodized salt use, salt only provides about 11% of intakes. So if 90% of the intakes in a population are coming, uh, salt intakes in a population are coming from processed foods and restaurant foods, it's critical that those sources be using iodized salt. Otherwise, we're not gonna be able to provide enough iodine to populations if we're only iodizing 10% of the salt that people are getting. So it's really important now, and the focus is shifting away from iodizing only table salt to iodizing all processed foods. This is critical in terms of achieving adequate intakes in populations. Now, uh, so it's important in, in low and high income countries that processed foods contain iodized salt. You can see on the left uh, data from the Netherlands showing that um, iodization of salt used in bread making provides about 50% of total iodine intake in uh, school aged children and adults. So in, in the Netherlands, ensuring that bread salt iodization occurs enables people to have adequate iodine intakes. In, in, and also in West Africa, this is important. In Ghana, we did a study that showed that two thirds of iodine intake in Northern Ghana was coming from bullion cubes. Now bullion cubes are seasoning agents used in West Africa and throughout the world. And uh, in this, in this um, region, it, was, it, was, it appeared that bullion cubes, which contain a lot of salt, were being, were being made using iodized salt and this was providing uh, iodine to the population. Among these school-aged children that we looked at, the median UIC and the estimated iodine intake were sufficient with the median UIC around 240 micrograms per liter and the estimated iodine intake around 130 micrograms per day. So they had adequate iodine status. And when we looked at the median iodine content of bullion cubes, it was about 31 micrograms of iodine per gram. So we estimated that a significant fraction of the iodine intake in this population was coming from bullion cubes containing iodized salt. And this is a current um, emphasis of iodine programs throughout Africa to ensure that bullion cubes are being made with iodized salt. The WHO has um, had two consultations looking at the, um, the compatibility of salt reduction and iodine fortification strategies in public health. When um, salt reduction strategies first came strongly into public health, there was some worry that perhaps these would jeopardize the success that we've had in terms of providing, salt, uh, pro providing iodine through salt. And WHO has emphasized that these programs actually, they're not, um, they do not jeopardize each other they um, are actually compatible and potentially synergistic. Uh, from the first consultation in Luxembourg in 2007, uh, WHO said at the country level, close collaboration between salt iodization and salt reduction programs is urgently required so that their aims are congruent. And a second consultation in Sydney in 2013 um, concluded the meeting demonstrated the potential to synergize both iodized salt programs and salt reduction programs to ensure optimal Im implementation by promoting their commonalities. So um, salt reduction efforts need to go forward to reduce hypertension in populations, but at the same time, it's important that all salt that's used is iodized. We can very easily titrate up the concentration of iodine in salt as population salt intakes fall in order to ensure adequate iodine intakes. So my conclusions from my presentation today is that essentially there's been 
remarkable progress in the control of iodine deficiency over the past two decades. The question is, can we sustain these achievements? At least the experience from Latin America suggests that we can. This was an article we published in Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology. The, the, two, map, the two maps show you um, historical data on endemic goiter in Latin America and the current situation showing that most countries are now completely iodine sufficient. So this is um, sustained elimination of IDD from the Americas. So this suggests that these iodine salt programs can be sustained and over the long term, they can improve iodine intakes uh, in populations. Um, also a conclusion from my talk today is that regular monitoring is critical, right? To avoid both iodine deficiency and iodine excess. Both deficiency and excess can have detrimental effects on thyroid function. So it's important that um, we avo avoid both by regular, regular monitoring of urinary iodine concentrations in vulnerable populations and by monitoring the salt industry to be sure that they're producing uh, high quality um, iodized salt. Now it looks like in, based on the available data that high coverage with adequately iodized salt can likely meet the needs of pregnant and lactating women and their infants. But we probably need more data on whether iodine supplements are needed or not in mildly deficient pregnant women. We know that severe iodine deficiency in pregnancy causes a lot of detrimental effects um, and can reduce IQ in the offspring. We don't know whether mild iodine deficiency also has this detrimental effect. Now, in many countries, as I mentioned, iodizing table salt is not enough. Processed foods must contain iodized salt if we're gonna use salt as a vehicle to provide iodine to the population. And finally, I'd like to say that salt intake reduction efforts are not a threat to iodized salt programs, they're actually an opportunity. So with that, I'd like to um, conclude my presentation and thank you again for the chance to speak at this important series of meetings. Thank you very much. Uh, that was an excellent uh, presentation uh, from Dr. Zimmerman. And I would like to th thank uh, Professor Dr. Theophilo San Luis Jr. from Philippines who's online uh, for arranging this lecture with Dr. Zimmerman. Uh, beautiful uh, lecture and uh, one of the words that stands out from the lecture is adequate. So adequate amount of iodine, uh, that's very important. Um, and salt is one part where you can get iodine, but uh, it also depends on the various diet people depend on, uh, especially in case of mother and children, one giving life and the other coming to life a very important role it plays in uh, both uh, mother and baby and in our overall growth, uh, brain development, uh, et cetera. So we said we'll take some questions. There are some questions here. Uh, not uh, all of them are related uh, to the subject, uh, but uh, you know, Dr. Zimmerman has beautifully put the subject in a very easy way for all of us to understand, so I'm not surprised there are any questions on that. But um, uh, one question is here, when is the next uh, International Thyroid Awareness Week webinar? So the next uh, International Thyroid Awareness Week webinar is uh, next Monday, coming Monday, uh, May 31st, and the timings are same. If anybody has any confusion, please make sure to write to us, and uh, we will make sure that uh, you have the timing right. Another question from one of the members is, uh, when is the AGM for uh, our Federation International? Our AGM we have planned on 9th and 10th of September, but stay tuned, we will be sending you more information on uh, the AGM. Uh, it's going to be online, the way things are going right now, we don't expect to be uh, in person, but who knows uh, if the whole world gets vaccinated, it could be a different story. Um, then one other question here is, can iodine cause uh, mental retardation in children? Uh, I think you heard Dr. Zimmerman, uh, he mentioned that clearly. 
a lack of iodine can cause uh, mental retardation in children, and therefore it is very important uh, uh, in child brain development uh, in the early stages and even later. Um, another question is, should it be mandatory to do a uh, thyroid test in children? Well, I mean, you heard Dr. Zimmerman, but most of the world um, that I know, most of them, there are still places that it does not happen, but most of the world has a mandatory blood test uh, and test of thyroid in children because some children are born without it. So I think that is very important and it must be mandatory that children are tested at the birth time for their thyroid uh, normality. Um, the timing is going to be same for the next uh, meeting. And uh, we have our next webinar uh, on the International Thyroid Awareness Week, which is going to be on Monday, May 31st. And Dr. Professor Leonard, uh, Leonidas Dantes from Greece has uh, agreed to do that lecture. Again, I wanted to thank uh, Exilexis, Horizon Pharma, and Merck KGA of Germany for their support on the International Thyroid Awareness Week and uh, Porto Novelli, uh, who, had, uh, who, who has hosted uh, the uh, WebEx for us. And uh, I wanted to also thank the Thyroid Federation International Board, uh, which comprises uh, Beata, uh, Nancy, Linda, Peter, and uh, we have invited member at large, Marco, uh, for all the hard work on the WebEx support and putting the lectures together on the YouTube. So don't worry, those of you who have missed this lecture, it's going to be available on the YouTube. And uh, if more people can subscribe to our YouTube, we can have our own Thyroid Federation International YouTube because they require like 100 subscriptions before you can have it on your own name. We would like it to like to have it on our own name. And please uh, subscribe to that. If you subscribe to that, we can have three or five um, uh, YouTube uh, channel. And that way, uh, all that we do will be available on the YouTube. So thank you very much for tuning in. All the very best. And see you all on uh, Monday, May 31st. And uh, thank you very much, Misha and Atil, for hosting this. Uh, bye for now.